Hello and welcome back to another season of the MotoGP Extra Podcast. Season 3, we've actually managed to make it there, but we're here for our first podcast of the year. We're going to be talking about the pre-season, so everything that's basically happened since the last podcast we did in November, obviously for Valencia and Grand Prix. I'm Reese, and joining me as always to discuss some MotoGP action is my co-host, Dill. So, obviously, with the the pre-season testing, there is lots and lots to talk about. So we are just going to jump straight into it, sort of go through the different manufacturers. And we're going to talk about KTM first, and probably more mainly Pedro Acosta, because he has been absolutely phenomenal in these pre-season tests. Initially, it looked like maybe it was just, you know, he was, he was dialed into the track because he, he had a bit extra time at Sepang, for example. He, was, he had the extra few days of the shakedown test. But even at Valencia before that, he was on the pace. And after that at Qatar as well, right up there from the start, Pedro, perhaps even better than we expected, Dill? Uh, definitely, yeah, 100%. Um, Valencia, it took him a, a bit just to get his head around carbon brakes, how you ride with the rider devices, the aero, and a bit of everything. And he just said that he was just kind of doing a couple things wrong. But whatever he did mentally or whatever training he did between then and the Sepang tests, by the end of the shakedown test, he was quick, really quick. And then everyone was kind of going, yeah, yeah, he looks quick, but he's had an extra two days over everyone and, and this and that. Like, But at the end of the, at the end of it, he was lap record speed, which is uh, outrageous. I know the bikes each year do get quicker and quicker, but for someone to jump onto it coming from other two class at some such a young age, it is like... People say next Mark is next Rossi. I think he's maybe above that because Mark has come up and he was quick and he showed promise and podium and first race won at Texas and so did that. I think maybe in this class at the moment it might be harder to kind of replicate the likes of it a first season for Mark is and stuff like that just because the equipment seems a bit more of a limiting factor. But I think if Acosta was on maybe slightly better equipment than a, a kind of satellite a KTM, not saying there's anything wrong with that, but if you put him on a Ducati, oh my god. I'd be probably tipping my hat for a race win in the first like two or three rounds because he he just seems to have the whole package. Now we do need to remember he looked like this as well when he came up into Moto Two. Had instant was on lap records everywhere and then kind of struggled as he got into season. So I'm really eager just to see the first round to really see how has he again has he matured in a way that he can kind of put everything together because there's so much more in these GP bikes than he's ever had to deal with. So it's a uh, it's an interesting one, but there is no question that future world champion without a shadow of a doubt. There's a good point you make there about obviously his Moto Two tests. Obviously, he was very, very good in those in his first season. Struggled a little bit, sort of got a bit of form, but then obviously had the injury. And his first rookie season was was pretty good. His rookie season was quite good for a rookie season in Moto Two, but yeah, didn't quite live up to the hype. So it will be interesting to see if he does sort of fall in the same way or whether he'll have learnt from his mistakes. I do think he probably will have learnt a little bit, not got too caught up in the hype or anything like that because he's clearly a very intelligent guy, very, very good rider and I feel like he, he's just constantly analysing himself and just just always improving so I feel like he won't make that same mistake that he did as he stepped up into Moto2 and actually some other interesting things about him were obviously, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but that shot through the penultimate turn of like Valencia, literally like his first down the bike was like sliding it, it was Unreal, it looked so good. And Aleish as well in, uh, in Sepang was saying that he was sort of following Acosta at one point and he literally looked like he'd been riding the bike for ages, didn't look like a rookie. So that is, you know, some strong praise right there and really is showing how good Acosta could be. He could genuinely be fighting for wins a few times this season. But the other KTM riders, they're not doing quite as well. Binder's doing okay. Binder is... Pretty much up there. I think Binder has been the fastest actually overall over the tests, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of the lap times. But you kind of expect that, don't you, with Brad Binder? I mean, he had a pretty good season last year. I think he let himself down actually in a couple of places personally, but um, overall his performance was quite good. He was there on the weekends that he should have been. I think he probably could have won a race. He, he probably should have done um, because there were races that weren't won by Ducatis that year and they weren't him that won them. So I feel like. When you're there week in, week out, you've got to be there the weekend that the Catties are struggling as well. So I feel like maybe Brad let himself down, but, you know, it was still a good season. And I think judging based on the performance in the test so far, we're going to see some more of the same, do you think, Bill? I'm kind of hoping from a, a step from Binder himself because KTM are on the up, there's no question, that year on year. For, for a while when they came into the class, they'd 
it had a weird way of throwing parts at it and then it would work but then it wouldn't work at certain tracks and then it wouldn't work anywhere like I remember when Binder came up and the bike seemed to work really well for that season and then it just went away and then they, they kind of got the odd wet race win with Oliveira and then Binder would kind of pull out a brilliant race performance to get himself a, a good result but the, the bike just was never there now over the last I suppose two seasons three years they've seemed to build 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 and they've got themselves relatively close they're clearly ahead of both Japanese manufacturers probably just maybe a step slightly behind Aprilia and I said probably a, t- a good touch off of the current Ducati especially GP24 we'll cover that later but I think the current RC16 has enough about it that it can it might struggle over a full season sprint race is qualifying and a, a main feature in a race every weekend to maybe put a title kind of push on but I think Binder is such a good rider I think he'll be closer in some place this year and I'd be I'd be very surprised if he doesn't get a, a full race win this year because again you did mention there last year a couple of races that maybe slipped through his fingers um there's, there's just something they were missing now I remember last year around Austria when there was I think BT or TNT or whatever they were at the time did a piece with KTM about their 2024 bike and they were very quietly confident and KTM is a, is a factory that they don't really kind of if they're getting excited they know something they're 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 not like Yamaha where like oh this this will fix it and, and then and nothing ever comes out of it if KTM are if confident there's something coming so the bike looks better this year um I think other than I suppose Jack and Augusto Augusto doesn't seem to get on with the new bike Jack seems pretty happy with it Augusto's gone on to the new carbon frame and it just isn't really clicking from Jack is a bit of a question mark because never been great in testing he, Jack needs to improve it himself more than like I look at Jack's season last year I don't look at the bike I look at Jack himself for uh, kind of going missing some parts of the season some unnecessary crashes but also some brilliant performances remember him in Breath, for example, and how he came out of the block support mode with some very strong rides. But I just, I just look at Binder and now obviously Acosta as well as their kind of leading force. And I think that is your 2025 Red Bull KTM factory lineup there. Uh, I think Miller will either be shipped off to World Superbike, Australian Superbike, or maybe might tuck himself in with the Gas Gas squad. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that one because I think it does look like the, the two the sort of the number one riders, if you like, are going to be Binder and Acosta. I mean, 100%. they've brought Acosta, well, they've brought both of them basically all the way through all three classes, right? So they are the, the sort of the KTM gold and children exactly. and they are, they're delivering as well. They're delivering on that, that potential so far. I mean, I know it's only testing, but Binder's performed over a season. Acosta, you know, he's this good already, so he's only going to get better. Obviously Miller, like you say, I think... To be honest, take out like round one and like what four of the championship. It's pretty awful season, really. Um, he was very, he was, he was very good at Portimao. I still can't believe how good he was there. Maybe it helps him to get the bike dialed in a bit more. So potentially we'll see him quite good at this first round of the season at Qatar because they've just had the two days test. Although there is more of a gap, whereas at least Portimao last year they pretty much had the test and straight into the race weekends or like the week after. Whereas it's a, I think there's a bit more of a break here, so. Maybe it won't try, quite translate as much, but I feel like he started off the season very well at Portimao. Obviously, like you say, he had the really good ride at Jerez as well, although the KTM seemed to work really well there, and they had that massive start advantage, if you remember at the time, yeah. the, the clutch. They sort of found that, so I think that kind of elevated them up into the top positions right at the start, and if you can take a good position early on in MotoGP, you can kind of hold on to it. It's very difficult to actually overtake, and everyone's so fast. There's not really that pace, pace delta. It's usually qualifying that does you in, which... It's funny because it's usually Miller's strength, but uh, <laughs> did seem like he was struggling with it last year. And Augusto Fernandez had a pretty good rookie season, all in all, I guess. You know, it was nothing fantastic. The fourth place at Le Mans, obviously the standout. I mean, he made Miller look a bit silly that day, definitely. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, other than that, didn't really go up to much. Didn't really expect much of him either, did we, to be fair? So I think he probably met or, or, or beat our expectations, but... Yeah, he's, he's not particularly a rider that I could see still being a MotoGP in like a few years' time. He'll probably kind of just hang around in the Gas Gas team until they either find someone better. So if they want to move Miller in there, they might get rid of him. Or if a promising rider comes up from Moto2 or something that they want to sign, they'll probably replace him with him. But yeah, I don't... Yeah, Augusto's been sort of towards the bottom of the time sheets in these tests and 
I don't really expect him to do anything amazing. I, th- I feel like he should be doing a bit better than he is, and I think he probably will be doing a bit better than he is once the actual season starts. But yeah, it's uh, I can't see him sticking around too much longer. So really, you've kind of got the two. The story of two halves here in in KTM. You've got the two that are going to go on to do some pretty good things. Although Binder, to be fair, does need to start kind of delivering that potential a little bit more. And then on the other side of the garage, you've got the two guys really fighting for their jobs, which, to be honest, is pretty much a lost cause already, I would say, at this point. I don't think there's much they could do about it. Unless Binder, uh, unless Miller, sorry, does some phenomenal season where he fights the championship. I'd say he's pretty much always on, already on his way out. I mean, there was rumours, wasn't there, that they were going to get rid of him for this year. So, you know, yeah, it's, to, uh, it's... The rumours were they tried, and I, uh, to be honest, I'd say... See, they kind of... The rumours appeared, Miller kind of brushed them off, but like I definitely think there would have been conversations had. Um, like we, you went back, we talked about his season last year. Good opening round, round four was Horatio, I believe. Good round there. When they brought the carbon frame for him, he made a step forward again and was on it a bit closer to the front. Probably didn't get the, re- the results out of it considering how much of a step in advantage that bike was. Again, tail off towards the end of the season. I, I kind of think Jack is a decent development rider. I remember back to kind of Ducati time. He seems decent with development. He kind of has a good idea. I could see him being tucked into Gas Gas for a couple of years. Um, if we say dish season, I could, to be honest with you, I could see this scenario as you were just saying there, kind of going on about how Miller and Fernandez both are probably got their days numbered. I could see the Pedro and Jack switch and Augusto staying put until Dennis Sancho is ready. Is that too far out of the equation? Oh, that's uh, that is an interesting one there, Dennis Onshu. I guess he is the next. He is the next sort of Red Bull. Get red, yeah, exactly. So yeah. he he was just the one that came to mind. Obviously, stepping up into more two this year, so still probably a good two seasons away from it. Would they hang on to? Like, I, I don't that's see him going out. Yeah. I don't see him going outside the Red Bull kind of tree at the moment to go get someone else in there. Um, but. I, from what I can see, Aki Ayo and the inter- internal with KTM, the Rebel kind of Ayo squads and stuff like that, he's very well liked. So I could see that somehow kind of transponding that he'd work his way up. And again, neither of us expect Augusto to kind of kick on and start coming at a top six, top eight rider right week and week out. So we can do both, both feel like he's probably has that seat until there's a better prospect comes along, really. Yeah, it's it's very much like I feel like a similar situation to Gardner that like he kind of won the championship in the end after like being around in Moto Two for a long time. Yeah, and they, they kind of signed him up. They kind of moved him up because kind of don't really have much choice, I guess. Oh, I mean you do, but kind of on those things like that. Although how for you because you've just won the championship for them, so yeah. you might be all right. But they don't really believe that much in them, I guess, because seat warmers. Yeah, yeah, effectively, because they were both IO signings. That's the way I look at that. Like, yeah, you say Dennis Onshu, good example. KTM, right from the beginning, you know. So was so was Chan initially, right? It was with them, you know. They've they've always had the Rebels uh, sponsorship through Keenan and, and stuff like that. And obviously Binder, right from the start, was uh, a, yeah. a KTM signing. And and Oliveira when he sort of went up as well. Aside from like the one season, did like Leopard in the middle because they didn't have a Moto Two team. He was you know he was with KTM through and through. So. I feel like those were KTM riders, whereas yeah. I feel like Gardner and Augusto Fernandez were more like IO riders. They Best like... of a bad bunch in Moto Two, kind of made into champions under IO's wing. I suppose is probably yeah probably a way to look it up. Yeah, exactly. Like IO thought, ah, they might be all right. Whereas you know KTM were never like sort of Ralph Fernandez was almost on that same umbrella as well, right? He was the KTM guy that they wanted to bring through. Obviously, it didn't really work out, but. Uh, yeah, I feel like that's probably their uh, their standpoint. So that's pretty much KTM. We've already assigned them riders for next year, and this one's <laughs> not even started yet. So <laughs> it's a good start, I suppose. But uh, I'll move on to the next manufacturer. Then we may as well talk about Ducati because we actually do want to talk about something a bit more serious. Well, I mean, obviously the whole thing's serious, but something a bit more unfortunate, shall we say? Uh, with Frankie Bobadelli, obviously um, testing at Portimao, not actually even testing a MotoGP bike. But it was a sort of basically a track day. Well, it wasn't a track day, was it? It was actually an official World Superbike test, wasn't it? Um, an official uh, World Superbike day, a VR46 track day. It was, it was kind of a yeah. mush. <laughs> and the Marquez brothers. <laughs> yeah, weird. It was a weird day. <laughs> yeah. But uh, basically, an official sort of uh, to test, uh, well, like World Superbike kind of test. Uh, but it was also available for other riders to turn up and come on sort of more production style machines, more like street bikes. So 
Uh, lots of the riders, like uh, Dill was saying there, the, all the VR46 guys, including Rossi himself, went, um, were there. Uh, obviously, all the World Superbike riders were there. A few World Super Sport as well. And the two Marquez brothers. I think that was pretty much everybody there. I don't know if there was anybody else. But, you know, this is kind of beside the point. That's what it was. And uh, at the last corner at Portimao, which is a fast, fast, tricky corner. I mean, I remember the crashes that Top Rack and Ray had there in Superbike a few years ago with the yeah. front ends. They were some pretty big crashes and they were just little front enders. Whereas I think Morbidelli, don't know exactly what's happened because there wasn't footage of it or anything, but seems to have had, is it a high side he's had in the corner? And It, it sounds sort of... a bit like Paul Espargaro's crash from 21, I want to say. Was that year he was on the Honda? Just kind of one of those, just as you get to the middle part of the corner, just came around and flicked them. But again, we've no footage, so it's we're kind of going off of what probably has been reported by the Marcus brothers because they were directly behind it they would have seen it um, but yeah. we've we've very Daddy little idea remember it. yeah he is he's openly said he doesn't have a clue what happened yeah so but uh, basically a big crash knocked himself out I think sounds like in quite a bad position as well the way he sort of his neck was and stuff um, behind him on track as you were just saying Dil were actually the two Marquez brothers who um, stopped pulled over obviously the, 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 obviously the track had been red flagged at this point so they could do that and they ran over to him and uh, attended to him um, before the marshals could get there and put him into recovery position and stuff which was obviously it's great great to hear in terms of oh it's great the sportsmanship and the care that's uh, obviously it's not great that obviously Morbidelli was in that position but you know it was good to hear that that sportsmanship and you know just the general respect and care for the riders is there um, but Morbidelli after effects of that missed basically all the testing the only test he did was at Valencia and he didn't look too promising at Valencia either so I think he should be back for the first race by the sounds of it but I don't really know what to expect from Frankie because obviously this is going to set him back even more but he wasn't particularly looking stunning anyway yeah Valencia after the race, it's always cold. It's always a bit shit, really, is that test. It, it's yeah, great to see it. it's great to see see Rossi's first ever ride in a Ducati, Lorenzo's first attempt on the Ducati, Marcus's first attempt on a Ducati. He's a bit of a, a team here. Same with Frankie. It was good to see him on his new bike. Coming from how many years has it been? It was it 2018 he jumped on the M1? So he's been there many years riding the inline four, perfecting his style to that. Obviously, the last couple of years the bike kind of went away from his development pattern. So he's probably maybe not had a very precise riding style in a way. He's probably tried to ride a bit different and maybe hamper himself a small bit. So jumping onto the caddy, fresh slate, he needed track time. He needed as many laps. He needed to get through his kind of pre-season kind of data, get through all the whole schedule, test things, work it out ergonomically. A lot of things had to go on through that test from and... It was very windy in Valencia on the Monday after the race. Was it the Monday or the Tuesday? I can't actually remember. I think it was Tuesday. No, I think, I think it's Tuesday, isn't it, usually? Usually, yeah. I think, isn't it like the Moto 2 boys and the Moto 3 go? Yeah, on Mondays, I think it, it was uh, like the Moto 2 and 3 Pirelli test on like Yeah, the, yeah, the I think that, that sounds familiar. So he had probably half a day, we'll say, on a really cold, windy Valencia. And again, I can't imagine it. That Ducati is very fun to ride around Valencia. To be brutally honest, that track is, isn't the greatest. So um he's now coming into Qatar. He's we all kind of reckon he'll be there come race weekend. Uh, at the time of recording this, we've just finished with the Qatar test. So testing is done. It'll be kind of two weeks or two and a half weeks until we have our first Grand Prix weekend. So you'd imagine he will be back for that. But he's after missing so much track time, uh, as well as not after kind of figuring out how he needs to ride to the caddy, as well as he's going to attract the people have already had two days at. Um it's going to be, in some senses, kind of similar in a way to Bastianini's year last year, where he's so far behind, but obviously the lack of knowledge of the bike is going to really hamper him. Um, Obviously, it's great that he's recovering and he seems well. He just He's just a bit tender um, at the moment, and that's pretty much why he couldn't ride. Um, doctors told him another big crash and a bang in the head could be a lot more serious than the first one. So, it's again, it's good that he's not trying to force himself back early or anything, but for someone who's coming into a very critical part of their career, it's probably one of the worst things that could happen to him really in terms of his career because we just just don't know what we're going to get from him now because even if he had the couple of days in Sepang, probably would have, he probably would have been allowed to ride in the shakedown, maybe. Maybe only one day, maybe he wouldn't have. I'm not too sure, but even if he did the full 
test kind of agenda in Sepang and then did a couple of days in Qatar, I still wouldn't be thinking he'd be coming in in amazing form in Qatar. I think it would be kind of half a through the season it'll start to click for him. But now I'm 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 concerned for him because we all know that there's Firmino Laguer in the wings looking to get into GP for 25. It's just, just a lot of people that want that seat. And one year deal, everything's just a bit messy and I just feel that things could kind of go downhill very fast for Frankie and it's a shame because again it's just train a training crash and it's really put him behind schedule for this year so um, we're kind of hoping that he lands on his feet again and kind of gets going with it and kind of maybe finds that feeling you'd imagine coming from the Yamaha to Ducati it'd probably be a massive step up immediately but there's definitely going to be things that the Yamaha does better that he'll have to train himself out of and get out of them habits and routines but it's, um, it's going to be probably a slow start to the season it's going to be hopefully the team at least kind of give him a bit of time to get him to somewhere where he can actually show off his skill because at the end of the day he almost was a GP world champion in in the 2020 season so we, we, we kind of are quick to forget his talent in Moto2 world champion he does a good rider in there it's just at the moment a couple of bad years on the Yamaha as well as an unfortunate start to his Ducati career is kind of maybe just put him out there's, there's one thing that I kind of see could happen um I see Digi as a bit of a stopgap. I genuinely don't think that VR Five Six really wanted him. In fact, it was signed so late. His form at the end of the season was kind of what kept him. Um, I could see Digi Ali being left go and Frankie being taken into VR Five Six for another year or two if he doesn't have a great season here in in Pramac. Um, I could see Valentino again being his own personal manager. Somehow, kind of just pulling the strings to keep Frankie in the in in the class if Frankie kind of wants that. So. Probably not all. He probably has a bit more about... He's a bit more leveraged than your average rider, so... um, Yeah, I've rambled on long enough for Frankie. Can you tell he's one of my favourite riders? <laughs> nah, no. So, yeah, you're always saying you don't like Morbidelli, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but no, generally, I, I re- really hope he is well for the first race. It'd be great to see him, and I hope he does find that step in form, because it, it'd help him out a lot. I think you make a good point there that... Uh, he won't fall off the grid even if he loses this seat to like Aldeguer or somebody like that because he'll always have a space at the Rossi team. But then, you know, where's Vietti going to go? What if Vietti wins the yeah. two championship this year? You know, he's on the IO bike. He could very well win the championship. We've, as we were literally saying earlier, that there has been, you know, kind of, not average, that's a bit harsh to say, but some Moto 2 riders that have shown glimpses but not quite a championship package got onto the IO and won straight away. So it's possible that we could get that again. Then do they want to put him in that team? But then if they need to fit more Bedelli in, where do they put him? And like you say, obviously there is Digi Antonio still there as well, although I'm sure they would probably prefer a VR46 rider over Digi, so they'd probably you know, move him aside if necessary. But it's just a very, very complex situation. And again, I feel like we've spent half the time talking about the 2025 season yeah. <laughs> before 2024 has even started. But uh, I don't think the next rider that we're going to talk about is going to help that anymore since we're talking about new riders of the Ducati. We may as well move on to Mark Marquez. Again, another rider who's had lots of things said about his future already before he's even turned a wheel on the Grassini Ducati in anger anyway. But uh, we'll try and stick to just his sort of pre-season and his preparation. He looked very good immediately, which, you know, is not massively a surprise at Valencia. He was, you know, don't get me wrong, he was at the top in the times, but he was up there. He was towards the top. Obviously, Valencia is a track he does like, so probably just skew it a little bit. But I'm pretty sure Bastianini said after like his first day on the bike that uh, he was already quicker than than the other Ducatis through some of the left hand corners. So that's uh, <laughs> you know a bit ominous for them already. That uh, Marquez after literally one day apparently is already quicker according to the data. Uh, Sepang seemed a bit more of a struggle. Didn't seem quite as good. Uh, there's some clips of him running through the gravel and stuff, which is going to happen, obviously. It's, it's testing, it doesn't matter. I mean, it happens to him on a race weekend. In fact, he's probably gone through the gravel and still like won races. Well, he almost did that, I guess, didn't he? Um, but you know what I mean. It's not unlike Marquez to take a bit of an excursion, but it did seem like you know the pace wasn't quite there for him. And same with day one of Qatar, but day two did a time attack like everybody else up there, sort of top four, so... I think Marquez is going to look pretty good, even going to a track that, again, he, d- he doesn't actually like Qatar. So to be P4 in Qatar on time attack on a bike that he has said he's struggling with a time attack with is pretty impressive. And I think we're definitely going to have some sort of Mark Marquez title campaign, but maybe not as dominant as we feared or predicted, because I thought he was going to just wipe the floor with them. But based on the testing, 
I think if he was going to do that, he would have just gone out and topped every test just to sort of mess with them. But he's not done that, so I feel like you know he's going to be quick and he's probably going to be fighting for the championship. But I don't think it's going to be a 2019 sort of domination or anything like that. Yeah, I, I think big thing that needs to be said, he likes Valencia, does not like Sepang at all, and does not like Qatar. There are two tracks that you would say that are not good for him, riding style, or just does not like them. So he doesn't get out either on tracks. Uh, also had a lot of technical issues. I'm fairly sure he lost like three out of four days due to technical That's true, issues. Actually. He had, didn't he have true. two Sepang, in? He lost, he lost two. a lot of time at Sepang, I know that much. And he also had a, a, another technical issue in day one at Qatar, as well as crashing in day two, which was first crash. So let's get the conspiracy theories out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's the tamper with the bike. Yeah, exactly, to be yeah. <laughs> um, but it's no shock that he's quick. The issue at the moment is his own confession that he's trying to ride it like a Honda. He's doing the you know anything of moving to another team and just kind of trying to force it to fit a, another manufacturer. Um, it'll take time. He obviously has massive strengths as a rider and he just needs to learn his trade. And again, we need to remember he's not coming off. Like everyone is making the comparison of 2003, 2004 Rossi. 2003 Rossi was top of the world. 2023 Marquez is after losing his crown, hasn't won a race in God knows how long, has questionably one and a half good arms and has left his left his family to join the 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 rivals. I'm not too sure what you call it. He's left the family environment of HRC and Rapsal Honda to jump on a four tier Ducati. Um so yeah. it's a it's a lot changing. It was never gonna be uh, not that it was never gonna be it was always gonna be hard to see him Rossi brought the family with him, you see. Yeah That's exactly yeah. Exactly. And also yeah. went from a good bite to a bad bike and not the other way around. So. Yeah true. But yeah. it's it's just the condition mark is at the moment he's not getting any quicker he's, he's kind of already said that he's like he's is he in it is he 30 now am i right in saying he turned 30 or 31 literally turned 31 i think the other day so yeah it is not his best days are over but like his outright speed has probably gone since 2019 2020 i think again now, his last at 30 so yeah like, 30 is a hard cutoff point like you don't like those exceptions, Davi, you could say probably had the, the perfect storm of a bit of experience. And as he got older, as well as probably started getting the, the when the Ducati kind of came at that time, his best years were in his, I suppose, early to mid 30s. Um, but that's not your, he's kind of the one, the one rider we would say that with Mark, I just feel. He's been broken so many times since that crash in Earth in 2020. So we, we've he's he's lost so much as in terms of mobility. Definitely lost a bit of speed, and then he's lost basically all everything that he lost with the Honda. That that kind of connection, the the way the bike development, that's all gone in that period of time. Now he jumped onto the Caddy, and it's he's jumped onto a bike that you wouldn't we really say it's a Marcus bike. It's never. It's all about corner exit, really, on that and getting kind of breaking as deep as you can, fair enough, stopping it and getting out of the corner using the power, using their brilliant electronics and the, the way the bike is set up. Whereas he's very known for his whole career chasing all the lap time on the entry. So it's going to take him a bit longer than a couple of preseason tests to basically undo all that Honda knowledge and on that, that muscle memory. So it'll take time. But again, if we had to race tomorrow, Texas. I'd be putting a five-way bet that he'd be taking the victory. Yeah, I think uh, he'll still sort of perform at those circuits, will dominate at those circuits that he always has, because I think that will just overcome and even riding it like a Honda is probably still better than the way the, the Ducati guys ride the Ducati yeah. at those circuits. So, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a transition for him. And weirdly, he will probably get better as his bike gets worse, so we might see a pretty consistent season from him. Yeah, that's and very course, true. The, uh, the GP23 should probably start as the, you know, you could say probably start as the best bike, but the GP24 actually um, is already looking super good, which we will talk about in a minute. But yeah, you do tend to get that these satellite bikes start off better. We've seen it with Zarko on the M1 in the past and stuff like that as well. So it's not just specifically a Ducati thing. And then obviously as the new bikes get more dialed in, get the upgrades, things like that, they do start to drop off. But if we're saying Marcus is going to start riding more like a Ducati rider, just keep getting better, we could get that sort of straight line, you know, just get straight P3s or something all season. Mm -hmm. That's uh, 
becomes the first guy like for, for God knows how long to win the championship that winning race is it like was it one two five wasn't it like, the only times ever happened oh like it's that, um one of America's team is Al Samora is it Al Samora yeah, yeah it's Al Samora actually isn't it I think yeah so like won the championship because I remember like the mere thing everyone's going on yeah. about that year because he almost he almost did it but he just he happened to win a race. You almost did it. <laughs> Come on, man. Why did you do why did you win that race for? <laughs> uh, but uh we might as well go on to talk about the GP twenty four as we did mention it there and sort of encapsulate, I guess, the rest of the Ducati riders, because if we spoke about all of them individually in depth, we'd be here all day because there's <laughs> about a million Ducati riders, isn't there? <laughs> but uh talk about them as a whole, I guess. GP twenty four looks phenomenal. They said it was gonna be a big step, didn't they? They said it was gonna be a bit radically different with the aero. Not so sure I've seen that particularly. It doesn't, you know, if you painted it black, I'd probably say it was just last year's bike. I probably wouldn't actually be able to tell the difference. Uh, I've not looked at it up close, so there probably is like bits that I'd be able to say, oh yeah, that's the 24, but it's not like as big a difference as they kind of made out, but it does seem to be a step in an improvement. Banyaya seems to like it. Martin seems to like it. Interesting enough, Bastianini seems to quite like it, I think, this year. So that could be quite interesting. He's been up there in. Um, two of the three tests, I think, so far. So that's, that's a good sign for Bastianini after what was a shocking season for him last year. You know, not all his own fault, but obviously he did do a great part of that season after his injury, where, you know, aside from Sepang, he was pretty much nowhere, which again, probably pinch of salt. We did tests at probably two of Bastianini's best tracks, Sepang and La uh, Salle. So, or La Salle, is it now? I know they changed it, and <laughs> it's a U instead of an O now. But uh, Qatar, we'll say, just, <laughs> just, just actually get it right. So, yeah, it could be, you know, it's it's kind of hard to tell with, obviously, Bastianini, but those are the three GP24 riders, because, of course, um, Mobadelli, like we said, is out, and everybody else is on last year's bike, but uh, that bike, ominously for the rivals, looks even better than the GP23. scary part is, we go back to when Peko took over Martin in Doha in turn one, he basically, well, not he, Ducati had a complete mix-up. They had two engines, they didn't know which way to go, it was messy. In the end, it worked out. But for a long period, there were different bikes, different engines. Everyone was a bit, I want that. This is what we need. Oh, no, that's the one we need. That's not good enough. That has this issue. That has that issue. They bolted the 2024 engine in in Valencia in the pre-season, the post-season of last year or so after the race. And it instantly worked. It prov- provided pretty much performance gains ever. It's pretty easy. Well, don't want to make it sound to kind of underrate them but it's pretty easy to make more power the issue in gp is making power that's usable so i'm pretty sure if ducati wanted they could probably find a lot more power but it's all about how much power that's usable as well as you don't want to kill a rear tire because more power more stress through the back wheel it's it's a might sound more power more more potential but a lot of it is a if you kind of go back to the the it was a 10 car a Honda that just absolutely made the most bullet bullet of an engine, but like it couldn't do anything else. It just had unbelievable power, but they just the bike didn't really do anything else. In Ducati situations that like they made power that work. So as much as they have probably the most powerful engine, it also probably utilizes most of that. So when they bolted into 24 engine, that worked perfectly. That was a massive, massively ominous step of Christ. If they bolt in the engine already and it's a benefit. Even if they use the 23 bike, they're already having they're already after making a step. 24 bike apparently is better everywhere, is kind of the rough idea. Reading between the lines, it's corner inches. What I can see is where they're after finding something. It's just a bit more pliant, I suppose. It just it just is better on the entry to the corner. Ducati still by no means are brilliant in the S sections and turning. They're still relying heavily on the arrow. Uh, you did touch there on the fact that they want about a completely radical bike and i think it is in a sense much different because the fair i'd imagine a lot of the would say the the aero tunnels and the kind of venturi tunnels through the fairing are probably very much redone and there's a lot of work going on there that we can't actually see because they were bigging up this this whole fairing that was going to radicalize things and change things a lot so I'd imagine it's a lot of things we can see is where they've made their gains. And as always, that's probably the most dangerous thing because that's the hardest to, as a, if you're a pretty KTM, you can't really, if you can't see it, you can't really copy it or it kind of take inspiration from it. So, um, a lot of people are tipping Marcus to kind of somehow get a championship about this on his first year. But I think the GP24 is so good that it starts the season out of favourite, as well as 
you did mention that Bastianini in Qatar and in Sepang is usually quick, so it's a bit of a kind of pinch of salt about him, but he seems to be just seems much happier. He was also a bit happier in Valencia last year when he tested the, the new bike, so it looks like everything is going well for him and he's back. Still don't think he'll be enough to do anything against Peko. I think Peko is slowly getting into alien status now because he is definitely becoming more of a complete package. Um, He's really tough as game. Pace is ridiculous. He seems to have his one lap pace back that it went missing a small bit last year for a period. So he just seems very strong. And coming into the season, we will do kind of chat with your predictions later, but I'd be probably putting my hat in him at the moment just because how well testing went. Testing always is, is, seems to go well for Peko. He is very good um, in testing and maybe struggles a bit more in the normal race weekend just with the lack of development time over a weekend. But this has been a, a really dominating uh, preseason. So it's going to be tough to beat him. And even if you can beat him, there's still another like three of them floating around. So it's going to be tough if you're not on GP24 because that bike looks like it's made one of the biggest steps Ducati have ever made, especially since they're now at the front of the grid. Yeah, I think Peko especially has made that sort of step over this preseason even. You know, the bike has improved, but Peko just seems to be... He's won the championship again. Um, obviously, like you say, you say he's a sort of approaching alien status. Obviously, I still look at it that he made two championships he should have won quite difficult to win, if that makes any sense. Like, 100%. Um, obviously, Martin had more of a chance than Quattararo did uh, because they were on the same equipment. So I don't really... Once that lead was gone and he kind of kept it even, I don't really blame him for that because it's difficult to pull a gap on a bike that's the same. And obviously he lost the lead through the injury and things like that. Well, it wasn't really entirely through the injury, but you know it played a part. But uh, the year before, obviously, he made it very difficult. But he's taken two championships to the last round where he had like huge a pace advantage at parts of the season so we'll be it'd be interesting to see if he can have that dominant season this year if he's got the if he's got the pace it looks like he's not got a lot over martin though it looks like they could be quite close i think we'll probably talk, talk about that in the championship predictions potentially but both of them looking really good banyaya has banya topped every test as well now so uh, maybe, actually, maybe not valencia but um he didn't do that many laps there did he, he just kind of did a bit of a uh, you know, just I'll just check if it's all right. I'm sure it's still nursed in the hangover, probably. So, yeah. you know, it's uh, <laughs> probably why. But so in 2024, the, the actual calendar year, I think he's topped both tests, right? So he is looking very, very unstoppable. And it'll be interesting to see going into Qatar what his pace is like, if he can sort of try and bounce back. Well, not not bounce back, sorry, continue in the way that he was at the end of last season because he won the, the last race. I'm sure he'll be hoping to continue it. Yeah, it'll be it'll be a lot tougher this year because he's won his first world title and now he's backed it up again. Definitely made it a bit more difficult last year for himself. But he's a two term world champion now. There's no question whether it was a Fabio Quattararo kind of falling apart, Yamaha dropping the ball, and that's where he won his title. He won it being the fastest rider last year. Obviously, he had the injury, had a six to eight week kind of moment of where oh martin is a bit stronger but then he still managed to grind it out in very champion a champion he won it in a champion's way where when it mattered he managed to get it across the line in certain races obviously we saw mistakes from martin a bit of kind of uncharacteristic like mistakes from martin of where tire choices and just some just kind of odd decisions from him and pramak and i think Pekka just seemed to be a bit more level-headed through the whole thing as if someone who's already after winning a championship and kind of had been there and had experienced that extreme pressure and just handled it better. I think he's only getting better. Um, He's still quite young. The Ducati's only getting better. So I think it he's definitely the man to beat. Um, The whole Marcus situation is interesting because I don't think Marcus is sandbagging. A lot of people are saying, oh, well, yeah, he's he's trying to keep everyone quiet and he's going to blow him out of water come race weekend. I don't see it happening. I genuinely do think that he's taking time to get used to this bike. It's such a radically different bike and the way you ride it is so different that I think it'll take him time. So start of the season, I think Peko is going to be definitely down to beat. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that one because he just is for even though we always say the old and I I've said it already on this podcast that the old bikes tend to go better at the start of the season. He's looked so good in this preseason and at the track where we're going to be racing as well. You know, it's going to be going to be difficult. And let's be honest, it's not like the data from last year is completely useless to them. They'll still be putting the same base setting in and stuff. So it's. Uh, I think he, he definitely goes into the season favourite. Well, he has to, isn't he? He's the, the sort of the previous world champion. He's looked so good over the testing. I think it is uh, definitely sort of Banyayas to lose. He could be getting to three world championships, which is re- really is getting, like you say, towards that sort of alien status. Because, I mean, Stoner only has two. He's considered one of those. So maybe Peko, you could say, is already there. But I think he probably needs a more solid title win uh, j- just to cement his status with that one. Because obviously the last couple were a bit shaky, but I do agree with what you're saying that last year he clearly was the quickest. Um, well, I mean, he was in 22 as well, but it was also like, well, the guy you're up against is on an absolutely terrible bike, but this, you know, last time he actually was on equal equipment, made my team make mistakes and stuff, so that was more commanding, especially that last last few rounds of the season, he really upped his game, I, I feel, but uh, we'll have to see if he can carry that into this year, and I did mention Fabio Quattararo there, so may as well move on to him now. The Yamaha, again, <sighs> You know, Mm. it's Yamaha, isn't it? We've got in the notes here, Yamaha is Yamaha, which Mm -hmm. kind of, I think, sums them up pretty well. To be fair to them, they've been topping speed traps. So (laughs) I think they've made a bit of a step. Now, I think, to be fair, Sepang, the speed trap is in the braking zone. So it's where the, because it would have been the design for F1. Uh, The speed trap is just before they break, which was already on the brakes for for the bikes. Yeah, so. Um, that kind of skews it a bit, but it does show that the Yamaha is actually getting good on the brakes, which is is a good thing to have because it's obviously always been a quarter speed bike. So meaning you don't want to brake too late and carry no corner speed, and probably will help them make passes still anyway. So I think there's been a bit of a step there potentially, and obviously they'll have concessions for the first time this year. So a Honda, who we'll talk about in a bit, they uh, obviously got to do some extra testing with their with their riders. With the, the shakedown test, Fabio Quattararo and Alex Rins were there doing those tests, so um, they're, they're allowed to have the two race riders there, which was which is going to be good for them. We'll see how much of a step they can make, but it seems like they still got the same weakness. Uh, the top end probably isn't as bad. Uh, it does seem like they probably still had made a step, even with the uh, the whole sort of you know raking thing, and that's good because that means they can put more arrow on more than anything. I mean, I know they're getting blasted on the straights, and obviously that's kind of annoying. But having more top speed means they can also put a bit more arrow on, which will help them in the other places where they're struggling, like the corner exits and the one lap pace. But unfortunately for Yamaha, it seems like the one lap pace issue is still there. Um, sort of at the end of the shape down test, I think Fabio was like second fastest time or something, and it, it looked pretty good. And I think even on maybe day one of the official test, he wasn't too far down. But once the Ducatis and the KTMs and the Aprilias start going for time attacks properly, the two Yamaha boys they just dropped back once again, and it looks like it's going to be another tricky season of just Q on at, like Q on performances and then miracles on race day to scrape top tens and the odd top five and odd podium when the track is a bit of a weird condition or whatever. Just it looks like it's going to be pretty much a repeat of last year, maybe slightly better, but again, they've made a step, but so have the other guys. So I think it's just going to be another season of bad qualifying results and overstepping the mark in the race to try and make up for it. So I listened to a podcast with Crutchlow just after day two of Sepang, and he's, he was quietly confident that they had made a kind of step everywhere. They were basically, they they knew exactly what they needed and they were very, he was adamant that what was coming would fix it and that they would be back towards the front. That was yesterday. Today, I see a headline from Quadrara that we still have no grip. So either what Cal is kind of hinting towards that's coming, uh, it's something to do with rare grip. It has to be to do with rare grip. Unless it's something aero, but then again, aero provides more grip in that sense. So whatever it's res- relating to, it's down to rare grip. Unless they haven't got that yet, or else it's after being a massive failure in Qatar. I don't know. The issue I have with their top speed thing is, if you look at it, they, they top the speed traps in Qatar. And again, we've already mentioned, or not Qatar, sorry, um, Sepang. We've already mentioned that the speed 
where it calculates top speed is at the end of the main pitch straight into turn one. It's slightly later than where it would normally be for a bike. It's where the cars are because Sepang was built originally for Formula One. You go back a couple of years and Jack Miller was blowing it completely out of the water top speed because essentially he was kind of taking the piss on the brakes and just breaking so much later. And he, by the time he'd get to the the transponder or whatever, his top speed was ridiculous. It made it look like the Ducati had found five, six miles an hour when it was just kind of jack skewing the, the, the data. Again, I think Yamaha, in a way, are kind of doing it. I think that they're still so bad out of the corner that they're not getting to the braking zone as fast, which means their top speed isn't as good, which means they can just pinch a few yards and brakes. So they're getting to the sensor closer and faster but not as fast as a Ducati that gets out of the corner, a KTM that gets out of the corner in the previous. So I still think the fact that they look quick in a straight line is showing that they still can't get out of the corner. It's just kind of skewing the data. It's, it's kind of, if you kind of think of it as, if they're not getting out of the corner, by the time they get to the end of the straight, they're not at the same 210, 215 miles an hour Ducati's doing. And they can just, just hold it for a split second longer, maybe five, 10 meters deeper into the braking zone and just, just that slightly alters the top speed figures and it makes it look like they're there. That's probably what I see. Um, in fact, Fabio has mentioned already that they still have no rear grip. That's that's their qualifying was completely not fixed. How are you going to overtake something? Like if we go back to the kind of analogy there, if they're not getting out of the corner, no matter how good their air is, how much improvements they made under braking, they're not going to be able to make that back and break. And we saw it so many times last year. Um, stands out memory Luca Marini at Bud overtaking Fabio and by like fourth gear he had like taken six seven bike lengths out of him and there was just nothing you could do you are a passenger so I think overall Yamaha have made a step but it, it looks like that it's probably not going to do him any good Um, over a 40 minute race it might take a couple of seconds off might be the difference between seven and eight but I thought I, I, I was optimistic until the in the Sepang, and again, the fact that Fabio is quite unhappy in Qatar again, that does not grip, and all the same noise are coming out of Yamaha, and especially from Fabio. Uh, Alex Rins obviously is new to the bike, so he's still learning and still kind of figuring out what's good, what's not good. But it's a big season for Yamaha because each team has their superstar. KTM has Pedro and Binder. Bar, bar Prilia, Prilia don't have a super, we'll probably cover them in a bit, we'll probably move on to them next. But Ducati has Peko and 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 we already mentioned that KTM have their superstar and Yamaha have Fabio at the moment, but it'll be quite easy for them to be without a superstar if they just don't get their act together, which they, they appear to be trying, but it's kind of ending in the same result. But I don't know, maybe I could be wrong. Until we see them racing and in a race situa- situation, because again, Yamaha's race runs are always amazing, but it's when we come to putting a V4 in front of them, whether it be... The, the KTM or the Aprilia Ducati, it just completely wrecks everything and does a, a lot of issues when it comes to race day for them that we probably don't see a lot of in testing. Yeah, exactly. You're not, you're not following up behind a Ducati like for 20, 30 laps in, the, in testing, are you? Whereas that's exactly what they're doing in the race. So it kind of ruins them when they're trying to take their flowing lines and then they just get blasted on the straight and then get people cutting them up so they have to break earlier and, and things like that. So it, it doesn't take into account those races, like you say, I think Fabio said he was sort of impressed with the way they were working, so maybe that's a positive they can take, that it is a bit more of a the kind of European way of working, or a bit like the Suzuki trying to take the hybrid best approach way, and we have seen that you know you do that with an inline four bike, you can win the championship, but at, uh, it, it is looking like very much of the same, and like you say about the superstars, they could lose Fabio if they're not careful. I mean, sure, the problem is some of Fabio's doing as well because he sort of led them down the path of the top speed. You know, he's not taken... You know, They haven't listened to... Uh, let's have a look. Dovi, Vinales, Rossi, you know. Mm-hmm. They haven't... Uh, even more Bedelli as well. They haven't listened to all these guys saying that they need more grip all this time. They've they've just followed the straight-line speed route because I suppose, like you say, it's, it's probably easier to, to get more power out of an engine than to get more usable power that gives you more grip and, and things like that. So probably the easier target so they just they just follow that because that's what they want to hear or you know obviously i'm not you know i'm not one to say that oh they're just taking the easy route but maybe that's the way if they think oh if that will help us get some more performance then we can try and focus on the grip after or something if we if once we start winning again or whatever but yeah it uh, doesn't seem to be 100 percent working but you never know with the Yamaha until you get to the race day uh 
if, if they have that little bit more where they can make passes, it's going to help them. But if you qualify, you know, you're not qualifying 12th and winning the race anymore. It's not, it just doesn't happen, especially when you can't have a take. But, you know, it's not like 2004. You know, you can't mm-hmm. qualify sort of nowhere and, and still fight your way through anyway. I mean, we uh, kind of tangentially to this, we've been watching some uh, old seasons lately and some of the starting positions that you see Rossi come, from, <laughs> come through from. Yeah. are pretty bad so uh, you, you definitely can't do that these days you're not going to be uh like what 20th while at turn one and then <laughs> about fifth while lap six or whatever it was something like that <laughs> something a bit crazy so and the probably the most interesting thing about yamaha we're seeing how rins gets on uh that could push the team on a little bit very good development rider again part of that sort of suzuki dream team if you like with the uh you know developing the bike and, and obviously winning that championship and I think, you know, no disrespect to Frankie Morbidelli, but a teammate that could probably push Quattro a little bit more is maybe maybe better. Obviously, Morbidelli was definitely closer to Fabio last year, but I think that's because Fabio had kind of gave up and was just kind of doing enough to beat Frankie, uh, except on the weekends where he thought there was a good result. And then suddenly there was a big gulf again. Uh, you know, India, probably a good example of that. And, you know, Mandalika and, and, and tracks like that, where all of a sudden, as soon as there was a good result on the table, Fabio kind of kicked into high gear. Maybe having a teammate like Rins will force him to do that more regularly. So they could just have better performances off the back of that. Maybe he's a bit more willing to fight for, you know, 10th place if, uh, you know, he's, he's got a, his fast teammate breathing down his neck or whatever. Right? Whereas, you know, a guy that he probably sees as having covered. Is, you know, to be fair, um, Quattararo and Morbidelli have been teammates for a long time. In both Petronas and uh, the factory team. And Fabio pretty much had him covered aside from 2020. So uh, he prob- there probably was that slight... slight psychological aspects of it. I'd love to hear what you think about that, but I think it could potentially push Fabio on a bit more and also just to see Rins as well, because I love his riding style. I really love Rins' style. And I think it will go well on Yamaha. Rins, for me, is like what we should have got with Danny Pedroza on the Yamaha. It'll be a nice, smooth corner speed. It'll be a nice a nice transition. Coming back from the Honda, the Yamaha probably feels amazing. Um, I, I still just feel that Yamaha don't have enough of a package for either of them to do anything special next year. Uh, it's not the bike anymore where really. it's amazing over one lap. Um, it, again, it's very good from first lap to lap 28, but not in the battle. So it's going to struggle there. Rins, I think, will be very good for the company and for the bike development. Um, if they, uh, But I, I guarantee we'll get a couple of rounds in. We might have the the Monday test after Haret and they'll be... Rins will be banging on the door that they need more rear grip. It's been... Since they've moved to the Magneti Morelli ECU and has gone to the Michelin tire, rear grip has been Yamaha's Achilles heel. Obviously, they we bang on about aero and stuff, and that's kind of part of it. But it's always been rear grip. Twenty the 2016 title was lost on rear grip. To 2017, 18, it was all rear grip. It was constantly they just couldn't get the rear grip. Um, so the fact we're now in 2024 and Fabio's no rear grip just want to point out as well when Davi came back off sabbatical jumped on that M1 as Rossi's team at back in Mizano 20 21 20 yeah it was 21 21 first yeah Rossi was on the Patronus so yes yes correct correct um when he tested immediately he said it needs more rear grip he goes and as at the time Fabio was kind of hinting and pushing that we need more top end to battle and Davi couldn't not really disrespectfully, but as a rider of his age and experience and race wins and obviously a previous world champion himself in the lower categories, Davi said, it's easy to say it needs more top end. The issue is it needs grip. It needs drive off the corner. That will, and to be fair, we're now another three years down the line, another Italian complaining about rear grip has, has left and they're, they're still not winning races really. So um, the further this saga goes on with Yamaha not fixing the rear grip, getting more out of the bike just kind of puts a puts Fabio further and further up the ranking of how good his world title was and how good it was. He almost won twenty his his second title back to back. I have said so many times in the podcast that I thought he was good in twenty in his championship winning year in twenty one, and I thought he was very very strong and stuff. But it wasn't until I saw what he did the following year then when he nearly won it, it really showed off his talents and that he is alien level. It, it's really a shame because. He's probably in his prime of his career now at the moment, Fabio, and he's just just on equipment that really isn't showing him up. It's a, it's a shame. It's a, it's unfortunate we don't get to see him more regularly at the front. So hopefully 
To be honest, I hope he saves Yama and Yama come back rather than him going away and jumping on something else because it's good to see at least one Japanese manufacturer up there. Yeah, the, the Japanese manufacturers are so historic. It's just, it's weird to not see them at the front. It'd be nice to see them up there a bit more. And really, I just, I was thinking that just just before you said it, I was thinking, wow, they've had, they have had these rear grip issues for years. Like, it's so strange that he was able to make it work in those sort of two seasons or the season and a half, I guess, sort of 21 and 20. To first off the season, he was. You actually, you actually forget how many races he won in twenty two. It was quite a few in that early part of the season. I remember, sort of watching some of the races back over this off season a little bit. Just you know, just just got bored or whatever. Just wanted to watch some GP and I thought oh, I'll watch twenty two. So you've seen twenty three. It was not that long ago, and he won quite a few races. And he was really fast. And he won at tracks where they were nowhere this year. And it's just. It's so strange. It is, it is so strange how he managed to do it. Just he's that sort of talented. He was able to make up for the difference and carry that corner speed and just do things a little bit differently. It seemed to work, but I think it's just now they're lacking so much compared to the others and it's so tight that he just can't make the difference anymore. I mean, I remember sort of 22 and he was out breaking people at Austria, like ridiculously got on like, the podium on the Yamaha there and it just it, it makes me think as well. Like twenty was a lost championship for Quattararo, really, wasn't it? it yeah, was, 100%. If it, if he was on the same bike as Wobadelli, the nineteen bike, he he absolutely walks away with that. I think so. Yeah, it's um, it's it is one of those one of those things. It is a shame not to see him at the front, but uh, like you say, I'd prefer him to stay with Yamaha and bring Yamaha on. But at the same time, you know, he's he's like you say, he's in the prime of his career. He's I suppose he's got in that aspect. He's got time for Yamaha to get better. He's you know he's not like an old rider. It's not like Marquez having to jump ship from Honda because he hasn't got time for them to get good. But you don't want to waste your prime. So you know whilst that prime's ticking away, he probably wants to jump onto a good bike and win a few more championships. And you know it's always that prestige of winning on multiple manufacturers, isn't there? You know it's always one of those things people want to do because they're like oh, I'm the best. You know it's not just the bike. I I've won across different ones. So. Again, twenty-five news, I guess we're talking about there. But uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll leave Yamaha half an hour, and hopefully they can uh, be a bit more competitive. And even if they're not good at the start, there will be more differences throughout the season this time because uh, obviously they can upgrade a lot more than the uh, than they could previously with the the new concessions that they've got. But we'll move on to Aprilia now because I think you did say that at one point that we'll talk about Aprilia next. So may as well go on and talk about that and another manufacturer that is. A bit strange. I mean, first thing I actually want to talk about before we get into any of the points, what is that spaceship of a bike that they pulled out at that, uh, <laughs> that unveiling? It's ridiculous, isn't it? Because all the testing before that, or like the previous tests, it kind of just looked like the same bike still, you know, the, the one from the year before. But then they unveil this bike, it's got all these bits of air on, it's not got a rear mud guard, it's, it just looks so bizarre. It looks so, so strange. I'd love to hear what you think about it, but just... I just got to say that because I remember seeing it when it got unveiled. I was like, what is that bike? It's just so strange. I feel like they're, they're really pushing the ball out there. Kind of, they, they kind of got towards the front when LH won at Silverstone or podium at Silverstone and then they were building and each year they were like, or if we just, just find a small bit else. I think they've got to the point where like, well, unless we risk it, we're not really going to go any further than that. So I think this year's bike is a... Roll of dice is the wrong phrase, but it's a bit more, does more risk. Because from what I can tell from the riders, well, take a late out of it because a late loves it. Maverick, especially, thinks the potential is higher, but it's not as good of a bike. In, it's not as easy to get as, as fast out of it, but it's there if you can get it. So it's like the better the rider, the better you can get out of it. But it's a bit more of a handful to kind of get the lap time out of it. So um, maybe you might see higher highs from this state from a pretty this year and lower lows is what could be with this bike. But um, again, I'm, I'm glad that they're they're still plowing along and that they're not going to resting that they've won a couple of races over the last few years and they've been thereabouts and they've been one of the top manufacturers. Um, so it's, I'm glad again that they've thrown another good push at it and, uh, the fact that we will at some point have four factory Aprilia's on the grid is a real good showing that they're they're kind of here to stay because it feels like over the last couple of years it's everyone's kind of taking a step back and trying to find their way out of the sport so the fact that Aprilia need to be really pushing on strong is, is good to see but um, the Aprilia is a great bike in testing it just struggles in racing it has a bit of that Yamaha can't pass as easily great bike probably 
maybe not the it's probably second to the Ducati over one lap, uh, especially in Alicia's hands. Seems to be very good in that sense. It seems to have the corner speed as well as the, the V4ness. Uh, and where the Ducati doesn't still really turn as well. So over one lap, I think they pretty really can get a nearly a complete lap. But coming into this season, it's going to be interesting to see one Maverick. He's been there long enough now. He kind of has to kind of kick on. Aleish getting to the end of his career. Can he go kind of one last good season? Uh, Oliver, kind of fresh slate really for him because of what happened last year. So many injuries, so many bad fortune really. And again, Raul, can he find a step now? We have in our notes here, he is on the old bike at the moment up until they can basically fully manufacture one and have spares. So he looks to be going quite well in testing, but it is last year's bike. So just kind of bear that in mind that some of his results are probably making him look like he's probably made a bit of a bigger step than he has when he's going to a track with an older bike that's kind of has a, a base setting and it's pretty well developed for that track. So um, it pretty has, a, again, another big year ahead of him because they, they seem last year, there sometimes they go missing again. Whereas you can't really do that against the Ducatis and I, I just feel like they could they could inherit Fabio Cotteraro and become a, a much bigger team. I think in no disrespect to Maverick, I don't think he's getting any quicker. I don't think he's good enough to battle and I, I just don't think he could do it over season. The fact he hasn't won a race yet and last year had so many chances. Aleish has been brilliant over the last five years with them. But again, he's he was never tipped as a world beater he kind of overperformed in most of his career and again the fact that he kind of had this brilliant story where he came through with the brilliant and kind of built them up to what they are it's great that he seems to be benefiting a lot from their uh, improvements because at one point it looked like he'd done all the hard work maverick came and then maverick just seemed to pip him straight away but seems to be kind of swinging back now that Alesh is the the lead rider and going forward we could see a lot of change, I suppose, in the next 18 months with a pretty really, especially in the in the rider development and rider lineup. Yeah, it is it is one of those things. They they did last year, they did go missing a few times, didn't they? Uh they had some really good races like Silverstone, um, because even before the rain, they were looking really fast, like all three of them. Uh well, not all three of them, but three of the riders, you know, the the two factory bikes and Oliveira wasn't too bad there either, one of his better races. Um Obviously, Catalonia was probably the high point, the one-two finish, um, and obviously there was the the sprint race as well, where they were both up there. Potentially could have been, you know, two one-twos there if it wasn't if it didn't quite play out in the the way that it did. So there were some highs, but there were also some weekends where they were just notably nowhere. Like you say, Vinales had quite a few opportunities to go for a win. Mandalika really, he probably should have won. You know, he, he caught up to Banyaya and then just seemed to just get stuck there and couldn't do anything. Was Almost amusing in a way that Vinales caught to the back of Banyar and couldn't pass him. And then Fabio Quattararo caught up to both of them and couldn't do anything either. Mm-hmm. And then Vinales and Quattararo were fuming after the race that they just couldn't overtake on their bikes, which, uh, to be fair, probably Mandalika itself played a part in that because obviously he couldn't really go offline. But then there was other tracks, obviously, really Catalonia, he probably should have won, but then he decided to use a different rim for some reason and got like the tire overheated. Still heated. don't understand that one. <laughs> yeah. You know, what I also don't understand was he was um, really, really good at Valencia. Was actually starting on pole position um, because obviously, well, he qualified there, didn't he? Then got himself a penalty in warm up, <laughs> and then used the soft tire in the race. Yeah. Which, by the way, he used the medium tire in the sprint, uh, which cost <laughs> cost him in the sprint by being on the tire that was too hard, so he didn't have enough grip. So then the race he goes, "Yep, yeah, let me use the soft tire when everyone else is using the medium or the hard." And then, yeah, he was good early on and just dropped backwards. So. Yeah, it was uh, strange for for uh, Vinales. Uh, Le Mans as well. You, you could just sit here all day going through the Vinales' uh, failed uh, victory Catalog. attempts, unfortunately. There are plenty. There are plenty of them. Um, but uh, it, it is a shame that, uh, that, it, that it does keep happening like that. And we could get more of the same this year. It does seem like Oliveira and Vinales are struggling quite a lot with the, the new bike. They've not been... Well, Vinales hasn't topped the test yet, so that tells you something's going wrong. Um, you know the, the the usual test day champion, as was he's so called by a lot of people. That uh, you know he's not top to test day yet, so that kind of is a bit worrying because, or maybe it's good. Maybe it's good. Maybe finally he's realised he's going to get point in <laughs> testing and that he should focus on the racing. But you know when he's happy, he's fast, and usually you know that's when he gets like twenty days to dial in the bike or whatever, <laughs> and that's usually why he ends up top in the time. So it's quite a it's a bad sign in a way. Uh, that he's not there. Oliveira, 
I, I don't know if he's really a tester particularly, but again, he's been quite far down the timesheets. Aleish, not been too bad. Aleish has been all right. And Raul, obviously, like you said, is on the old bike until they uh, they get a new one for him. So you kind of can disregard him because he's on a different bike to the rest of them. So, yeah, um, it could be a bit of a one-rider effort again. I'm sure they'll probably get they'll probably find something, probably get something a little bit sorted. You know, once they start looking at each other's data and stuff, they can make a step. And I'm not sure, actually, what level of concessions Aprilia have. Because it's like a tiered system now, isn't it? So there's like four tiers, I think, are like Ducati in the first one. It's like the nobody in the second one. And then like Aprilia and KTM in the third and Yamaha and Honda in the fourth, something like that. I'm there not... is something weird this year. It's not a normal on or off kind of concessions. Yeah, so it is like there there are tiers and depending on what they have, they get a certain number of wild cards and obviously the bottom tier you're allowed to race with, uh, sorry, test with your race riders. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what they're allowed to change. I don't know if it's there pretty much as it was now. Ducati are banned from having like wild card test riders and then basically the, the Yamaha guys, Yamaha and Honda get the extra concessions basically pretty much like what they had before. I think maybe that's kind of what it's like. I'm not sure exactly. I know there's a limit on the number of wild cards in like tier three and two. Obviously tier one bans them completely. So yeah, I, I, you know, I don't want to get too much into concessions talk, but it could help a brilliant. They might still be able to make some, some inroads, but if they're, you know, if two of your four riders are struggling, it's not, not a good sign because they're not, bad riders by any means we've seen very very good things from both of them on aprilia bikes obviously i know i was going through and saying all the races when Yarlis didn't win but he still you know he still finished on the podium in most of those so it's not like he was nowhere um so yeah i'm, I'm a little bit concerned about aprilia I, I am a little bit concerned about them but we'll have to see we'll have to see going forward because you know, it's, it's easy to sit there after testing and say oh they're nowhere but you know we've had this before atm last um, year yeah exactly Case in point right there. We were saying, KTM are looking terrible. They're awful. First round of the season, they were amazing. And then, for, in fact, for the first few rounds, they actually looked like pretty much on a par with Ducati. Yeah. But then they, they did seem to drop back a little bit after that. So, who knows? Could be <laughs> could be absolutely anything. We'll just have to see how they get on with their development. And another manufacturer that we need to see how they're going to get on with their development is Honda, obviously the final manufacturer, the one we haven't spoke about yet. Honestly, I don't know if I have a lot to say about them. They looked good over one lap. and They didn't look very good in race trim. Um, I know Zarko said something like he got asked, you know, is the new bike better? And I think he said it was about seven tenths better or something. I know there was some stat going around that Mir was like about a second quicker than what he did in like Q2 or Q1, whatever it was of Malaysia. <laughs> Q2. <The> actual <laughs> <re> <laughs> Well, you know, he did get Q2 a couple of times. Like He did it like Bud and that. You know? He definitely didn't do it at Sepang, yeah. <laughs> anyway, right. There was, but we also have to remember last year, there was that start of Alex Marquez being like two seconds quicker and uh, on the Ducati. And, uh, yeah. you know, he didn't win like every race, did he? So it is, it's a take it with a pinch of salt because actually something I do want to mention, even though it's nothing to do with Honda, basically, the times... Seem to be ridiculously quicker. They, they, the bikes have made a big step. I know the tracks are rubbered in; it's good conditions, but they are breaking records. I didn't think were possible at the like some of these tracks. So, is it a bit more of a twenty twenty two season where we're getting a big step from the previous year? Because I'm getting that kind of vibe. I mean, you know, let me know what you think about you know both the Hondas and that that point there. The Honda, to be honest. I'm I'm actually I'm happy Honda have kind of if 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 we watch the whole of this year and Mir makes Q two ten times, qualifies front row once or twice, and finishes in the top ten twice all year, I'd actually think that's a good season for him. Because it at the moment <laughs> Jesus Christ, yeah, exactly. At the uh, we go back to last year, twenty three, couldn't get a lap out of it, and it had nothing in the race. So if they've least shown that they can produce a bike that or maybe it shreds its rear tire and goes backwards or whatever but like the the stat you were mentioning that it was I think to be exact it was 1.1 seconds quicker than he was in uh, his Q1 time versus what he did in the test now Sepang is very very dependent on weather conditions depending on time of year it's very humid there track represent there's, there's a there's a lot to it that's 
the bike isn't one point one seconds quicker. That it's not as simple as that. Um, like for example, like Nakagami wasn't one point one seconds quicker than his qualifying time. So it's it's kind of a it's it's it sounds amazing that they found one point one seconds and they lost was it eight kg seven kgs or something a lot That's of a weight. Rumor like that, that wasn't there. There was a rumor that they, they shred a lot of weight. Now it's hard to see how like eight kgs is so much weight. That is ridiculous. For if we go back, remember Petrucci's like diet and weight loss trying to he was he was on death's door trying to lose like one or two kgs just to make a small difference if a bike could lose eight jesus there was something seriously seriously wrong in terms of the, the development stuff seems that this year's engine for honda is better uh, but it all kind of comes back that it looks like the bike may be able to hold its better over a lap but i don't think anything in the race now as they maybe understand a bit more maybe they can kind of do the opposite of Suzuki used to do and they can kind of figure out the race runs a bit better than qualifying of historically that uh, Suzuki that Mir went on to win a challenger couldn't really qualify but on Sunday it was one of the best bikes out there at the moment it looks like Honda's the complete opposite of that where he might surprise a few people on Saturday might have a couple of good sprints but really on Sunday he's kind of going to be in for a war pain and that goes for Mir, uh, Marini as well Um. He's gonna have Marini a is a bit sad there, isn't he? That's, he is exactly like so. Was, anyway. So maybe he'll he'll benefit from that, but it's just if you sit here now and think of all the Ducatis, you think of the KTMs are pretty you don't you don't see how a Honda or Yamaha can kinda of go up one to one and beat any of them really. Um even with their their improvements. If a Honda's beating a KTM, it's a bad weekend for a KTM, not a good weekend for the Honda, is the way I look at it. And I could kind of compare all the Japan. The Japanese manufacturers in that kind of sense where if they're beating any of the Europeans, it's a bad weekend for the Europeans instead of, oh, Yamaha looks strong this weekend. They're up in the top six. It's like, oh, no, KTM have absolutely no real grip. XYZ is happening. Oh, they really have an off weekend. That's they why. Broke the special it. Chang tire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's a, it's one of those things where, again, Yamaha and Honda both have made steps, but still, we, we, I, I look forward to I look forward to Hurret, put it that way. I don't look forward to the first few races of the weekend we've always seen are a bit fruity, to put it mildly. Things Let's change. not forget the 2022 Honda on the podium. Though. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Oh, they're so, going to be targeted then. This Polis Vagra almost won. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> bet we looked a bit silly with that one. Um, well, I can't <laughs> remember what we said about it, but I bet we were saying, we, oh, that Honda looks good, man. We definitely didn't. We definitely were like, Paul did amazing. I'm going to check this after the actually. That was like that wasn't that our first episode. That would have been the first episode because it was first, the second we, side episode. Yeah, it? exactly. If uh, if we went back all that far and said that he was going to go on to do well, we probably should have ended it after one episode. But anyway, uh, it's 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 going to be another tough year. But again, the fact they have so many um concessions out, I'm looking to see them making big steps throughout the season, and maybe if we get to the mid season and they they do kind of find something, maybe around Aston time. I wouldn't be surprised if they're using their test days wisely. Yeah, it sounds like they are making the most of them. It sounds like they've booked a lot, so we'll have to see how they actually get on with their uh, their testing because you know they 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 do seem to be trying to maximise the concessions they've got, which is good. Unlike you know how we've seen before, where like Yamaha and Honda have not used the test days they've had available, even like you know they've not used their test riders that much. Whereas sounds like maybe they've even been told, look, we've gave you these concessions, you better use them, kind of thing. So <laughs> well. Uh, We'll have to see how it develops. Obviously, it is a good step on the one-lap pace. I think I glossed over them a little bit, but they, they were really happy. They genuinely were really happy with the one-lap pace. And then the next day, the, the race runs, and they were all just not very happy. They, they, they dropped The tire dropped a lot. So, yeah, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see how they get on in the races. I think you make a good point that they could be good in the sprints, but, yeah, we'll we'll have to see. It's It's strange, Honda, as well, because they've... I, I don't mean this in the wrong way, but they've also not got, like... A uh, superstar rider, I guess. I mean, Mir is, I suppose, the closest they've got. But Mir's never been superstar in terms of the amazing pace he's had. He's been more of a very complete rider, very smart. Where he goes about it, he puts complete weekends together. He doesn't, Darby. you know, he, yeah, 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 kind of, yeah, pretty much. But uh, if you think of the world champions that we've had the last few years, he's probably the least superstar like in terms. Of, you, you know, you don't expect him to 
wrench a bike that's not up to it to a position that is. Uh, although his 21 season was very good, actually. I think that was actually better than his 20 yeah, season. Yeah, his 21 season and, was so overlooked in terms of what he did. Yeah. Yeah. The, because the Suzuki was decent that year, but it wasn't by any means, you know, he destroyed Renz again. He destroyed Renz, really. And obviously he was he was up top of the in the championship up there with Quattararo and Morbidelli and uh, not not Morbidelli, yeah, cool. not Morbidelli. <laughs> Panyai. I don't know where Morbidelli came from. I think I was just saying Quattararo and and just yeah. filled in the gap. But <laughs> I think I'm getting I'm getting confused with 2020 probably as I'm saying that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Anyway, he had a really good season that year, didn't he? So may, maybe I'm a bit wrong. That was the point I was trying to make. But you know, Marini, Zarco, Nakagami, they don't. They don't strike me as like the guys that are going to win any races, quite frankly. Um, because I mean, Zarco's won one, took him better part of a decade to do that, yeah, and had very months. good equipment. Yeah, has had very good equipment for pretty much that entire time, aside from the, the KTM six, year, six seven I months guess. in KTM. Yeah, yeah, and then you know we'll see what he did the rest of that season. But I guess maybe the Vinci Ducati wasn't going to win a race, but... He did get a podium on it, though, at Bruno, do you remember? He did get a podium on it at Bruno, yes, when Paul turned in on him and he got a penalty on And the, <laughs> the, the epic long lap penalty. Yeah, oh, I still think about that to this day. That was still ridiculous. Uh, that was on the, one of the first ones we'd seen as well. We thought they were all going to be that cool, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's fair. That that was a rubbish long lap penalty, by the way. Like They lost like basically nothing from that. <laughs> it was a slightly wider <laughs> <Yeah>. line. <laughs> Oh, I miss Bruno, man. I miss, I miss Bruno. Me too. Uh, yeah, it would have been. Yeah, we're, anyway, we're going off track, I guess, with that. But uh, yeah, so well, my point was Nakagami's never won, had the chance to and crashed once. And, you know, never going to probably come close to that again, really. He's not shown that form really since that year. He was quite good at a few rounds, but ever since he's been nowhere, pretty much. You know, Marini is Marini. So, you know, again, never shown race winning pace, shown some really good one lap pace, actually. Last year, he made a good step in that direction, but he just faded immediately, pretty much. He, he never really led the races for very long that he was on pole four. So, again, can't really see that. And Mir's only won one race. So, between the, the four Honda rider lineup, there's two victories. So, it, does, it, it doesn't exactly fill you with sort of confident even like the two rider team of yamaha has more wins than that by quite some way so mm. you know it's uh because that's not even fabio just stat padding that's uh rins as well i think rins itself has more wins than the whole of the honda lineup so yeah it's uh it, it's it's interesting because the bike obviously isn't quite there but even the rider lineup i think is a bit underwhelming so yeah i guess we'll have to see how they actually get on in the season, but we may as well finally go on to our championship predictions. We did allude it earlier on. Um, let's not go really boring with this. Let's try and be a little bit more interesting. You know, maybe give some reasons as to why we think what's going to happen is going to happen. I have a feeling that it's going to be another bit of a Martin Banyaya battle with some Marquez mix in there. That's sort of my opinion. I think I think that's that's a bit safe, isn't it? But judging off the preseason. Martin, even though Pecco has taken the headlines, Martin has been right behind him every step of the way. Like, not big gaps at all, very small gaps. And that's good because it shows that he's not sort of lost his head after the closeness of the championship, because especially at Valencia. It looked like maybe things were getting to him and he was losing his head. And we, we've seen previously when things aren't going his way, it could start to go wrong in 22. For example, he crashed out of about 20,000 races mm -hmm. because of all of the, you know, all the issues that are going on with the engine and stuff. So it's good to see he's taken that momentum forward. Looks like he's still going to be challenging Banyaya this season. And you'd be silly to count Mark Marquez out. You know, Bastianini could be involved in that. We could get a four rider Ducati title fight. And who knows, Binder or Acosta might show up. I can't mm -hmm. see anybody else being in it at all. I think I remember like Mojib 2022 predictions I made. Like I predicted, oh, it's going to be a massive title battle like 2017, like loads of different bikes. But that, it could happen, could happen this time. But, but I think it will be more once the season sort of goes on, it will be kind of like a couple of head to heads. I think it could be Martin versus Banyaya with Marquez sort of making an appearance, depending on how to scratch that bike is, to be honest. For me, it's the GP24s versus Marquez. Um, I don't see Aprilia 
Aprilia's, Aprilia's riders aren't good enough in my eyes. KTM have a rookie that has potential to go on to greatness and has a lead rider that has potential to win world titles. But I just think that the GP24 has moved even further away instead of the gap getting closer. They, that, everything they've done with the engine, the fairing, whether it be a new swing arm or anything else that they've done in, internally with that bike, it's just made such a step that the fact that we're going to Qatar and it looks like the GP24 is the bike to be on already worries everyone. Um, Mark will figure out the Ducati. Will he win on it? I'd imagine he'll win his usual races. I don't think it'll be a shock when he wins in Texas. Um, Saxon Ring uh, is Aragon back in the calendar next year or this year? He's back on the calendar, so, yes. Just three. Like, if I said to you, well, no, uh, yeah. exactly. If I said to you there now, name three races Pecco's guaranteed to win. I can't think of any that Mugello, he's gar- maybe mm, Mugello. Yeah, that's I, I'd give you that one. Uh, Mizano, he's all in quick at crashed out of most of them. Um, Austria is a Ducati track, so I wouldn't say it's a Pecco track. He's pretty good at Aragon as well, actually. Yeah, Although Mark true. has Mark is on the equal machinery and not a broken arm, probably just yeah. won that one this time. Yeah. Um, although Banya is probably also a lot better of a rider than he was at that point in his career, so that just changed things up. Uh, where else I, is Banya quite good? That's that's the thing though. There isn't like Rossi had Haret, he had Catalun, he had Magello, Lorenzo had Le Mans, he had Qatar. Lorenzo had a couple of tracks as well, also that's Valencia. Real. Estoril, exactly. Stone. I know that was only for a couple of years, but, you know, but still, Stone Philip Island. Yeah, Philip Island and Laguna. Yeah. There was tracks that, right, like if you look at Peko, I don't, that's probably maybe, it's not really a weakness that he doesn't dominate at a couple of tracks. He's probably not been in the class at the top end for long enough, but I you know, just, you you look at Mark as you go, yeah, Saxony, lads, don't bother. Roll the bikes on Saturday evening, big barbecue Sunday morning, leave Mark as do 28, 28 laps on his own. Save the petrol, save the trees. Um, Texas unless it's something goes like again unless it's like another 2019 where he's come to leading and something happens I don't see he's so good in the left hand corners it's almost it's it's going to be nearly impossible to beat him there as well as give him a bike that's now equally quick and by the time we get to Texas uh, maybe not Texas but the time we get to either Aragon or Saxon Ring, he's going to have half a season under his belt on a GP23 and him and Frankie Caracetti are going to have to figuring out a lot with that bike so there's a yeah if I have to put someone right now for the championship I'll go Peko just because of his preseason factory rider looks like he's mentally maybe he's figured out some demons again he's always been quick in testing and if he's put under pressure, he might crack. But last year, he was put under a lot of pressure in certain situations and seemed better. So I think if he can kind of make a similar step that he made from 22 to 23 and 23 to 24, I think he'll be very close to be, uh, being the complete rider. Um. So, yeah, I, I'll go peck off. I have to put a rider on it. I actually didn't say a specific one, so yeah, I'll, uh, that's why I did it. That's I'll, why I, I will say it as well. <laughs> so you're like, oh, yeah, so I'll say a rider, you know. Just... Pass it back. You know what? I'll go different because it'd be boring if we said the same. And I think Marquez is the easy answer. So I'm going to say Martin because I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say Marquez because you like, can be like, well, he's won so much before. And, you know, I, I could just blame it on the bike if he doesn't win. And Banyaya, you said Banyaya and he has been so good at the test. So I'll say Martin to be different because I also hope that Martin can take it to him because I, I'd hate it for last year to be his, his only sort of time fighter for the championship so it'd be good to hopefully get that round two of their uh their title fight because it was a pretty gripping one last year it must be said i was on the edge of my seat so um it was definitely a better season um 23 uh 22 had some good narratives but the racing wasn't as good whereas no, they actually did go to head to head a couple of times which was was always pretty good to see especially at uh, uh valencia it really got tight didn't it it was uh oh it was a good season finale wasn't it so hopefully we can have that going into this season. So thank you for listening to this episode. We will be back in a couple of weeks time, I guess, to talk about the first round of the season. And you'll know by then who is going to win the first one and maybe a little bit of how the championship is going to go, but you can never tell this early on, but hopefully you did enjoy that. If you did do like the video, if you're watching it on YouTube or do rate the podcast five stars, if you are listening on Spotify, it really does help us out. 
But until that first round of the season at Qatar, we'll see you.